What is up, brothers and sisters? It's Jay Campbell, and you're listening to the Jay Campbell Podcast. Join me for regular deep dives with amazing beings whose work is manifesting a golden age. And remember, you create your reality by your focused thoughts, conscious words, and intentional actions. Raise your vibration to optimize your love creation. Hey guys, what is going on? It's Jay Campbell, of course, the founder of the Jay Campbell Podcast now, which is, I'm still kind of getting used to say that because I've just recently changed that, but I'm very excited today to be joined in my virtual studio by Dr. The Amazing, Dr. Amy Coleman. Before I give you guys her illustrious pedigree, I want to say, Amy, welcome to the show. How are you? Thank you, Jay. It's wonderful to be here. How are you? Uh, a lot better talking to you. Let me say that. So let me guys, let me guys give you guys her bio. Um, she is a very distinguished person. It's an honor and a privilege to have her here today. I actually heard Amy speak at Dr. Dan Stickler's uh, Appear on Zoy conference before the world changed, uh, literally the weekend before. How's that? Uh, in early March. And she's amazing. Let me give you guys a little bit of her bio. So she's the United States. She's an Air, U.S. Air Force flight surgeon. Um, and she was appointed as the youngest first female commander of the U.S. Air Force Special Operations Clinic, which is amazing. She is sought out for her mind, body, and spirit approach to patient care. Um, she's been elected the primary physician for four-star generals, seriously, U.S. Embassy folks, Special Forces teams. I mean, you name it. She also served in Iraq during Operation I Iraqi Freedom. Thank you for your service, by the way. Um, she's a family medicine physician at the University of Kentucky Wildcats, which I happen to be a big <laughs> fan of. Um, and she's also certified in Jack Japanese acupuncture from Harvard, which again, pretty amazing. And right now she's currently the CEO and founder of WellSmart, which is a company which cultivates technologies and healthcare strategies that strengthen the patient doctor relationship. She's also written an amazing book, uh, which my wife and I are going to get that I was just looking at today. Again, it's an honor to have you here. Again, to say um, your presentation at Appear on Zoe was my favorite one. It blew my mind, and it's been like a, obviously a strategy of mine to get you here to talk about what you talked about there and just to kind of share who you are as a being. So, with all that said, before we jump into some of these points, you know, how did you get on the Jay Campbell podcast here today? Well, I think you let the cat out of the bag, Jay, because I think it was at that Precision Performance Summit, March 6th. At through seventh, it was um, it was the week before everything shut down. So uh, I think I remember even being in a cab ride over to the conference to give the presentation and hearing that South by Southwest just shut down. Yes. Um, that the the city and all the other conferences had been um, the plug had been pulled on those, and and so we were like the last conference standing, so to speak. Right. Right. You and your uh, lovely wife Monica was sitting in front of me, and uh, so. Um, yeah, it was uh, it was the inaugural uh, Precision Performance Summit, and yeah, so we all got to meet each other, and it was uh, just wonderful that you know you pulled me aside because you know this type of information is is something that's um it's so funny that we consider it advanced, but it's actually the oldest healthcare form that we have as well. <laughs> no, no, nothing new under the sun, right? <laughs> that's exactly right. But the truth is, it's just like, you know, re-energizing it or, you know, re-transferring it into the ether, as I like to say it, so that more and more people um, can find access to it. Well, again, it's an honor to have you here. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you one-on-one. -on -one. And obviously, I know that my audience um, is going to really benefit from this. So I got a lot of points. I mean, obviously, when you sent this to me, I think it was like you sent it to me about 10 days after. So the world had just slowly started to change from the shutdown or whatever it is. Um, but obviously, a lot of things have changed since then. So we may go in different directions. But um, I want to talk a little bit about Eastern medicine. Um, and obviously, you know, your bullet point was just the underlying history of becoming conscious. Like, I think that's a fascinating point. So just talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So the Eastern tradition. Uh, was really revolutionary in the fact that they blended everything in one that we kind of now consider separate. And what I mean by that is, you know, currently we have what we consider maybe spirituality or religion, 
and then we have our health and well-being, and then we have um, our mental or cognitive uh, prowess, right? And, and, and we sometimes keep those separate in our current day world, but back in, I'm talking even, you know, talking about maybe if we're talking BC, like, you know, before AD, so this is actually in like the negative values of time, sure. um, you know, 14 centuries ago, in 14th century BC, you know, there were these uh, warrior priests or warrior monks, and um, they were trained as elite soldiers. They were trained as physicians. And they were trained to serve their community because oftentimes they actually were the governor or the governess of their communities, um, you know, keeping the order and, and, and serving as a, a humble servant. So uh, it's interesting that they took that trinity of you know, mind, body, and spirit mm -hmm. into their profession, which became uh, just their regular day's work. And uh, when it comes to us, we seem to separate that Right. and have a little hole for each thing and a little space for each thing. And we might get to one before we get to the other, but theirs were intricately balanced. And I believe when we talk about consciousness, um, what they start to dial into is how the body is a reflection of all that we do, say, think, and are, and how it oftentimes reflects in ways that can be physically um, noted. And if you know where to look, if you know where to press, you know what problems you're actually having. So, you know, um, they went as far as educating the public about how to listen to their bodies. Mm -hmm. They went as far as actually teaching them exercise, but not, not exercise that actually stimulated the adrenal glands into like a high production of adrenaline or wore down their bodies from overtraining. They, they taught them exercises that were martial art movements but also tied into breathing, like Qigong. Sure. And so they took something that could be very simple and made it very difficult by the just um, the deep introspective concentration that it took. And with that deep introspective concentration, a connection to body and mind was developed. And then when it came to serve in the population, that's when they started thinking more transpersonal, which meant they got above their ego. Um, a lot of times we're driven, you know, by what we want, you know, our desires, our wishes and things like that. But they actually started teaching, even as doctors in the community, not only these martial arts skills that tied them to their breath work and to the kind of a calming relaxation of the nervous system, but they also tied the community into this sense of serving beyond self, seeing, seeing beyond who you are and serving others as self. And we know from epigenetic studies that when you tie into that transpersonal experience, that you turn on so many genes for longevity and anti-inflammation so that the immune system can work to keep you well. Because right now we're having just this onslaught of people that have weary immune systems, autoimmune issues, you know, um, inflammation in the brain, inflammation, all these other places that, you know, I've never seen in my lifetime as a physician grow so quickly, so fast. And so what I saw when I started studying the Taoist tradition, mm -hmm. which is this ancient art of Eastern medicine, which was, it was, um, it was, it was looked at from many different angles. They took some Buddhist techniques, they took some Confucians, Confucianism techniques, but then they brought in this realization that there is a unity consciousness sure. and there are laws to the universe that when we follow, we can be our best selves. And so they did this over um, I think 14 centuries in the BC segment. And then up until even about the 1950s um, AD until actually communism really took over and began to get rid of everything that was old, everything that was mystical, everything that was higher consciousness, because they wanted just the facts, ma'am. They wanted just the, the nuts and bolts of what would, um, you know, take the pill and leave or stick the needle in the place that hurts and go. It was more along the lines of shortening um, uh, the aspect of the trajectory to wellness. But back in the ancient days, they knew that it was a lifetime trajectory. It was an experience over every day that you lived and that you had to culminate all three of these things. This idea of a relationship with mind, with body, this idea with relationship with transpersonal nature, and this idea of even just keeping, keeping the body uh, healthy through um, eating right and just 
and, and, and keeping your body well in, in physical ways. I mean, they were some of the first that actually uh, recommended uh, intermittent fasting. Right. They were some of the first that recommended you know, um, um, a, a low grain, uh, lots of vegetables diet with minimal protein that was, you know, lean. They were some of the first that actually developed um, herbs and how to use them, right. um, which were the first supplements. They were the first to actually use some plant medicine. So, you know, if you think about some of the things that we think are so dynamically conscious and that we are certainly growing in our consciousness and in, in these, in these leaps and bounds, now, I mean, you should have seen what was happening back then, right. because it's, uh, again, you know, um, it's, everything is old under the sun, there's nothing new under the sun, however you want to say it is typically how it can, how it can be defined. See how quiet I am, like listening to you, just, you just, you definitely are lowering my heart rate, you're, I mean, you're just, like you said, you're exchanging energy, and you're putting me because of your skills to where I need to be. But there's so much that you just said that I want to kind of unpack and we don't have all day. <laughs> but yeah. what, you said, what you said about autoimmune disorders and dysregulation and so much of that happening right now, I want to ask you, and it's just my theories too, but I'm reading a, or I just finished an amazing book um, called um, Rainbow Energy or Rainbow Radiation. And it's basically a study of the radio waves um, that, you know, since AM radio really started pounding the universe. And then we also had radar from military in World War One and World War Two that we've changed the electrochemical nature of the auric field, right, of the Schumann resonance, obviously of our own. And now fast forward to now with 5G and all of this other intense, you know, electrochemical, you know, radiation, pollution, whatever you want to call it, EMF, blue light, all of it. Do you think that really that ultimately, I mean, obviously combined with, as you said, systemic inflammation, brain inflammation, neurological inflammation, is that more a result of what we're doing, meaning man from an industrial standpoint to the environment? Or is it more because, uh, or is it all in together, the combination of like crappy food, you know, engineered food, people not exercising, obviously obesity is growing. We have EDCs. I mean, we, again, we have this biochemical cascade and siege to our biological systems. Is it kind of a combination of all those things? I mean, I know this is kind of an off the wall question I'm asking you, but you're very, very diverse in your awareness and knowledge. What do you think it is that's truly leading to all of these people having this immune dysregulation and autoimmune disease? Cause like you said, it's everywhere now. Mm, it's such a great question, Jay. And I see it all the time. As a matter of fact, I just got off the phone with someone that is a high achiever. Uh, she meets all of her goals, raises five kids as an executive, um, and uh, just is an amazing lady. But she's having trouble with her immune system. She's breaking out everywhere. She has stomach issues. Um, she, feel, she feels like uh, she can't concentrate. She's got brain fog, and she's actually you know, in this state of like, why, why me? I'm taking care of myself. I run constantly. Um, I, so I'm exercising and I'm eating right. And it's really interesting because I also have a, a, <laughs> have a partner, not a partner, but a friend that's also doing the same kind of work I do. She's a functional integrative medicine doctor too, trained in family medicine. And um, she sees a lot of people in a very high end area that have personal trainers, personal chefs, have everything aligned um, and and she comes in you can't you can't improve her diet you know it's just perfect already you can't improve her exercise program it's, a, it's perfect already you can't improve you cannot improve her um, her meditation because she's got an instructor for that and yoga and, and she does it all but yet she's at the worst um, health or he uh, than that she's been or he has been in decades now now how can that be and and I will I'm, I'm gonna say something that might um, might be quite shocking but um, one of the things I see is that we're developing a lot of hyper stimulation and a hyper sensitization yes. and 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 this this may go to a place that you haven't thought about or maybe maybe even you might have a question mark over your head when I say it but I'm going to go ahead and say it and that is the I've, I've been in medicine for 20 years and I can tell you that I've been exposed to a lot of biochemical warfare I used to have to get the uh, anthrax shots which were eight injections um, vaccinations and 
every time I got one, you know, little black area of my skin would fall off. So I knew it wasn't good for me. Right. So I know about, you know, and oh my goodness. And in Iraq, we had these burning piles right. of everything you can imagine. And, and, and typically we we all have, you know, some kind of a blessing of enzymes that allow us to break down and eliminate um, not only our own hormones, um, but, but things that are externally um, brought into us, uh, heavy metals and things like that. Sure. Um, and, and, uh, and, and some people have not actually inherited those types of strengths of those enzymes. And so maybe more challenged in getting rid of those types of um, insults and injuries. Um, we have multiple factors, Jay. I think mm -hmm. one of them is that we've got, you know, highly estrogenized society, yeah. the pesticides in our crops and the, and the, and the, the BPA that uh, leaches out of plastic is seen by the body as an exogenous estrogen. Right. And so a lot of times, you know, back in my day, my great grandma, when she went through menopause, it was nothing but now women go through menopause and it's like the kiss of death because they feel so miserable well that's because typically the estrogen and progesterone are supposed to come down right. you know like uh like a like a plane coming in for landing that right. they, they follow the same glide path but what we're seeing is the estrogen is going up as the progesterone is going progesterone is going down you've got this it's, you had a schism, almost like a schizophrenic type of um, reaction to all of these um, extra exogenous estrogens. Now, again, you know, with following that and making sure your enzymes are clearing that and having a good naturopath or a good functional integrative medicine doctor or a good acupuncturist can keep you in line with that. And with the vibrational forces that you tell, um, you know, you're talking about, you know, that does have some input on how we vibe as well. However, however, I have not seen um, as much destruction to the immune system as come as what comes from our own inner battles. Right. What I have seen is that the immune system follows the consciousness. I agree with that. And if, you're, if your consciousness is, I gotta fix everything around me, I've gotta make it perfect, everything around me has to be just right before I'm feeling good, um, what happens is that's a moving target. Right. And you're never actually going to get the um the cure for yourself because that target is never staying in one place for you to even be able to predict what it needs in the next exactly. moment and so from that comes this deep intense kind of um unrest which drives up the body's you know you know what i'm getting ready to say the fight or flight sympathetic nervous system yeah. which is like kind of running a war running a mission running a high uh, alert high, high alert, alert, alert. hyper vigilant survival reactive mode right. and and i just can't tell you how many times that has botched missions in the military sure. i can't tell you how many times that over time you know, your body will let you away with running fight or flight for, you know, maybe in your 10, 20s, maybe in your 30s, but in your 40s is starting to say, whoa, wait a minute. Right. You know, my parasympathetic rest and digest nervous system is not getting the energy because it's being pulled into this, this mobilization for hypervigilance, reactivity, and survival ship. And so what happens is that you people I see have decades, like 10 or 20, 30 years of not having the energy to repair themselves at the end of the day, to have the energy to in the in the right form of the nervous system to have for it to have access right. to repair themselves, rebuild themselves, nourish themselves. Uh, what I notice is when that goes on for that long. Interestingly, the immune system is part of the parasympathetic rest right. and digest nervous system, and when that hasn't been given the right energy for long enough, because it's been the energy has been siphoned off. Sure what happens is that immune system becomes hyperactive. It's almost like a child that hasn't slept in days and it's running around the room and you're like, how could you be running around the room? You haven't, right. you haven't taken your nap in three days, but right. yet they're saying, I'm fine, I'm fine. So the immune system often acts like that, you know, exhausted child. And in reflecting your own consciousness, which often it does, it will become that hypervigilant, hyper alert hyper reactive hyper survival type of of reactivity itself and so you'll start to see people develop like even autoimmune issues right. or um things that they were there's becoming sensitive to that they never were sensitive to before and so that becomes this chronic inflammatory response um, syndrome and it can be set off by 
a chemical. It can be set off by a fungus. It can be set off by a food allergy. It can be set off by anything. But what ends up happening is the immune system goes on full alert attack in its exhausted state. Because think about it. If you're going to actually be a good immune system, it's a very high consciousness endeavor. Right. You've got to look deeply at what's an enemy and what's a friend. And you've got to really be discerning. But what happens when you're super tired? It's probably easier just to drop a napalm bomb, isn't it? It's probably easier to it's probably easier to just drop that atomic bomb on everything and hope it goes away. Right. That's what a tired immune system does. Right. And so what I what I try to do for my patients is guide them over to how they can plug back into that parasympathetic nervous system that becomes less sensitized. Because we're living in a world that wants us to become more and more sensitized. And so the conscious value that we need to start to inherently adapt and adopt is how do I desensitize? How, would I, how do I desensitize to, to some of these things around me? And how does my immune system become the best it can be and be able to discern what's truly a threat and what is not. Because I'm telling you, as we're adapting through this modern age, I feel like, you know, our bodies are probably going to adapt with some of the things that we never knew we could adapt to. And that could be both for good and bad. However, the body is extremely adaptable as long as you're giving it the energy it needs to adapt. And when you're not giving the energy it needs to adapt and you're in the fight or flight nervous system, you're turning on a lot of genes for inflammation. Right. You're turning on a lot of genes for things that break down and become catabolic to the body. You're not able to burn fat because like in any war, if you go to a general and say, hey, you know, um, why don't you just burn those provisions over there? He'll say, no, I don't know what's coming next. And that's why a lot of people have problems even with obesity right now because they're constantly in a state where their liver is saying, heck no, time out. You know, I don't have the energy I need to do my peacetime duties, so it's not gonna happen. Mm -hmm. And so yeah, there's a lot that's going on in our, in our cycle, our vicious cycle. Not only does the, the sympathetic nervous system steal from all of that, but it also, we've inherently as a culture developed this understanding that somehow being in the fight or flight state is more productive when we're in this hypervigilant reactive survival state, that we're gonna get the career promotion, that we're gonna get the attaboy, that we're gonna be able to write, you know, 20 books instead of one good one that took five years. You know, and, and the thing is, is that, that you, we think that we're in the productive state in the, in the fight or flight nervous system, but what happens is our brain waves actually collapse yeah. because in that reactive survival state, you really only need to make survival decisions. So your brain waves are like eight to 10 hertz. I mean, they're, they're shortened brain wave lengths that only allow you to get out of trouble. And if you're trying to do your best work while being you know, chained to this system, this fight or flight sympathetic dominant system, you're gonna be amazed at what you're not able to do if you were to be able to see above that. And here's the trouble. The trouble, Jay, is they did a lot of tests on people that were insomniacs. And the first three or four days of not being able to sleep, they reported that they felt horrible, miserable, because their body was going into that fight or flight state of just reactivity and survival nature. They were drained. But after about a week, those same patients, they would ask them, how are you doing now? Because you're still being sleep deprived. It should feel worse and worse, right? Well, their mind actually started compensating in the reactive state to say, no, I'm actually feeling just fine. I got over it. I've actually adapted to it. I'm feeling better than ever. And that's exactly what they, these people that were being sleep deprived said in these studies. Wow. They, they had themselves convinced that they were just as smart as they were when they were sleep deprived the first four days, even though it's two weeks into sleep deprivation. So this is what happens in the reactive survival mode as well. Your ego, your sense of self gets large and defensive. It's like the big shield that drops down between you and the world and it wants to be your warrior protector. So of course it's going to put up a front. Of course it's going to say I'm all good and I'm all that. Of course it's going to say I have figured it out. And, and you're, going to be, you're going to be fooling yourself 
because the the mind plays tricks. Yeah. And that's never more evident than when I used to be in the hyperbaric chamber when I was um, studying to be a flight surgeon. They put you through all the, the techniques uh, that, that pilots have to go through to be able to physiologically manage flight in, in your body and your mind. And we'd be up at a, a, a high altitude and they would, um, they would depressurize the cabin so that uh, our oxygen went down. And it wasn't really like a survival oxygen state. So they had us remove our oxygen masks <clears throat> just so that we could feel what it would be like to be in that situation. And interesting, then we were, <laughs> we were handed out texts tests on a clipboard on a sheet of paper that had simple arithmetic, some division, uh, like uh, some kind of little crossword puzzle that we had to do. And we were kind of timed, like who could do it the quickest and the best and the fastest, right? We didn't have our oxygen mask on, so we really thought we were, we were balling. We were like, oh, we've got this. This is no problem. <laughs> and it was, really, it was really comical because people got very belligerent. They were like, you know I can't answer this right hey hey this this question's stupid this right. this is silly why are you asking me this this makes no sense right. who made up this test right. Right. and then uh and so they put answers down or and they were like okay i got a hundred and turn it back in then we put our oxygen mask back on and uh after you know we got some good oxygen things settled down what we noticed is the people that thought they got all these answers right got all of them wrong the people that uh, the people that the people that were the nicest became the most belligerent, <laughs> and what it was was a testament to ourselves to say, "Listen, when you're in an environment that is presenting physiological challenges on you, you better get out of your head." Right. Because to be honest with you, it can lead you down a path of destruction, not even knowing it. And so that's what the Eastern medicine um, um, world really taught was you know, how to use other parts of your intelligence. And that's one of the things I learned in the military. So should you be in the heart in a situation like that? Should you be in the aspect of the heart chakra to react or to respond? Would that be where you should go instead of out of the mind? Well, um, interesting, interesting that um, it's, it, I, I've never really put together like a process for it, but what I notice is this. Um, I've taken care of a lot of um, engineers, take care of a lot of pilots, a lot of, a lot of you know, officers and astronauts. And what I notice is the highest performing levels of these people have this intimate relationship with their whole self mm -hmm. as their intelligence. Um, that intelligence is not just from the neck up. Of course. Um, you know, when they say they use, you use only 5% of the brain, that is exactly correct. Right. Other 95% is below the neck. I mean, right. you know, we think of the central nervous system as just the brain and the spinal cord, and we think the intelligence is, this, is the brain. But the intelligence is the whole central nervous system. And what that, what that means is those spinal nerves that come out of the spinal cord and wrap around and perfuse these huge networks of nerves around the gut, which is the mesenteric plexus, sure. which also corresponds to the third chakra, believe right. it or not. Right. So chakras are really just nerve energy bundles. Right. Um, so that, that area, that mesenteric plexus, that gut, that gut feeling is a very, very strong part of um, your whole lifetime and other lifetimes of what you've ever experienced, it being able to act on your behalf to keep you out of danger it acts it acts actually outside of time and space in the moment to be able to give you the information you need if you're listening and plugged in so i remember when i was a flight surgeon stepping into a fighter pilot squadron for the very first time and the last um flight surgeon was really kind of a he was a little bit of a jerk and i don't mean to say that in a bad way but he was lo he was low on time and he needed to get his flight hours in so he'd just come in and he'd say hey listen when can i get into you know when can i fly with you i need to get my hours for the month and, and he wouldn't offer anything to them he was just kind of like a moocher right and, and and so i came in they thought i was going to be like the same type of person so i came in and i just kind of felt this bristling and i just felt this kind of like okay um and but i felt in the moment when when they were when they were coming to meet me i felt i felt them kind of size me up and it wasn't from their brain they weren't thinking a thing they were feeling are you going to help me or are you not going to help us right 
are you going to be here for us? Are you going to look, are you going to, are you going to be part of this team? Or are you going to be part of yourself? Right. And so I felt that distinctly. And I, and I know from flying with them a lot that they use that inner instinct to really know what was right and what was wrong in the moment. And then I saw it also in four star generals who were able to look over a room even if there was like, you know, people they'd never met before. And they were able to just in a moment click and say, that person's going to be my aide de camp. That person's going to be my, my executive assistant. That person I'm going to keep as far away from me as possible. Not by the way they looked, but, but, but by this kind of intuitive gut instinct, which is so important to tie into. And then you're right also, Jay, the heart is a lot larger electromagnetic force field and is the very first to be developed as a, a fetus. Mm -hmm. And not only that, if you think about how long it takes to get over a stroke, which can be years, think about how long it takes to get over a heart attack. Your body goes into instant healing mode. I mean, people that have a heart attack have to be fixed then and there, or they are dead. That tells you exactly how important the heart is to the body. And mm -hmm. when it takes an organ two years to heal, you can tell that the body is saying, we have a little time on this guy, on this, on this part of ourselves. So, you know, the heart itself is going to be a huge magnifier for being able to make our way in the world. Um, and not only that, keep in mind that there are more cells in our body that don't belong to us than our own. And those are the microcosms of our gut flora that are constantly speaking with our brain to tell the brain everything's okay or not. So we have signalers, we have these deep invested lighthouses that guide our direction. And when we do finally come back to the brain and say, okay, where do I stand on these matters? You know, society, my training, my upbringing has me upside down in a ditch. And that's how I'm supposed to figure out um, the, the truth of things. Well, the matter is you're never gonna find out the truth of things when you're in your, your charged, hyperdynamic survival reactive state because of there's narrow brain wavelengths. So you've got to then go to your higher mind, the embodied mind, the mind that is in the right brain, that creative brain they used to call for artists that now they call the embodied intelligence mm -hmm. or the relational intelligence. Right. And in the military, this was actually where we found out that you could prevent PTSD if you had a good crew like if you had a wonderful team if you had a team that you would just go to bat with or you would you would put your life in their hands and they had been pre-screened and ordained to be part of this high elite team with you they actually act as a part of your own brain the mm -hmm. relational or embodied mind so part of your own experience of knowing which side is up are the relationships that the people around you and how you react to that and how you integrate with that. Now, um, have you read the book by uh, Sebastian Neuer named Tribe, where it talks about how this deep, deep connection with this embodied relational mind is what kept people from being too much attached to that logical, rational mind, which becomes a prison of the mind. Right. Right? Yeah, so, absolutely. So all of this has to do with being able to balance our intelligence in a way that shows us what's right side up. Mm -hmm. Because it'll be so easy with all of the hyperstimulation coming in, with all of the changes and nuances from the news, and all of the technology and advancements in this, um, this plane of, of wavelength forms that are bombarding. It would be so easy to slip into this disguise that you have it figured out or that you even have a theory for it. And my, my suggestion, you know, from Eastern medicine teachings and even from, you know, some of the most ancient wisdom, you know, masters is, is forget what you think, you know, and, 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 and really tap into some of these realms that are unknown and being in the present moment and tying into these deeper realms of your intelligence, you might be very surprised that the guidance comes in ways that you didn't see it coming. And the wisdom comes in ways that are, um, were evolutionary to what, how you used to think before. I mean, you just, there's so much you discovered. Um, I like to think of the heart as the, co I call it the coherence capacitor. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Existing as a high conscious being, you know, if in my opinion is understanding what is coherent and resonant 
versus what is dissonant and incoherent. And that, you know, that recognition or that awareness really does come from that individual person and their, as you said, their exposure to any, you know, external stimuli, whether it's just a person that they just come across, you know, in an average everyday occurrence or somebody that they work with or somebody that's a peer. Yeah. Um, it's, it's all very interesting. It's like you said when we were talking off air that like every person is an entire book, a completely new awareness or experience for you to, to learn from, right? Like everyone can te- is a teacher. Um, I did want to ask you before we shut this podcast down because I want to be fair to you. I mean, honestly, I could literally like learn underneath you and mentor underneath you, but I know you, you, you have some horse stuff to do tonight. I want you to talk a little bit about trauma. And, you know, a lot of my readings recently is um, on transgenerational trauma. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, essentially the sins of the forefathers or the sins of the mother and mm-hmm. just the whole idea that, um, you know, we come from, you know, ancestors that have had physiological you know struggles embedded or imprinted in their dna and i know that epigenetics is ultimate determinant still today there's no hereditariness it's just your lifestyle and whatnot but there is trauma that i think that we do inherit from our parents and i'll give you a really good example before you explain it for people that may don't know what the hell you and i are talking about and that is um the last depression in the you know 1932 to 1946 historically a lot of people that went through that, which would have been our grandparents, um, they, they transferred to their children a scarcity, a lack, and a limitation mindset in a lot of ways. And it, again, was very real because they did not have, right? Like they literally were standing in bread lines. There were not jobs. There was not economic opportunity. There were a lot of limitations. And so that was kind of transferred over a lot of people. And, you know, I look at my dad, who's now very well off financially, has no financial concerns at all. Um, and he still has a massive scarcity mindset and a lack and a limitation, you know, complex about him. And and that's just the way he lives. So can you just talk a little bit about that before we end this on like, you know, how big trauma, you know, again, transgenerationally and just, you know, from an integration or an unintegration standpoint for people, like how big of a role does that play? It's really interesting that the Eastern medicine doctrines speak about this too in Taoist tradition, a classical Chinese medicine. And it's, um, you remember when I talked about the, the people who uh, had perfect lives of exercise, diet, nutrition, meditation, and, um, and just were checking all the boxes that we know is, is the right thing to do. Well, um, there comes a time in your life where when you are, vibrant and vital and you've got deep reserves of energy um, because you've built them yourself you've proven yourself Mm -hmm. that's often when that deeper construct of the of the deeper layers that you've been that's been passed to you of the of the generational pain that's usually when that starts to surface because in the eastern medicine tradition they call, uh, there's, there's these extraordinary meridians, <clears throat> divergent meridians that go deeper than the organ meridians. Right. And they act as reservoirs. And they're reservoirs for things that we experience, but don't have time to deal with in the sure. moment. Sure. And we put them behind us and they go into these deep reservoirs, <clears throat> both in our brain, in certain areas like the amygdala, or, and, and because the body and mind are the same and connected, in the in the in the body they go in these deeper reservoirs of meridians that then start at some point knocking on the door that hey you're okay now it seems like your vibrancy and your reserves are high enough uh can we deal with this energy that's been you know been been in storage and you'll start to feel kind of this bubble up of something that doesn't feel like yourself kind of like where did this come from out of the blue and it's interesting because often if you're with your mom and dad you might have felt something similar Mm -hmm. or you might have kind of known this from somewhere else you know and and that it doesn't make sense that it's coming up to see you now because things are just so perfect you've Mm -hmm. just created this beautiful existence and should be perfect because you you like to fix things and you fixed it all well now is the time 
that those hidden things that are in the closet or the basement or what you call the attic or wherever you call it are coming out to actually be processed because any energy has to be digested. Any energy, whether it's food you eat, that has to be digested, a memory, which is an electrochemical signal, has to be digested, and, and memories also store in the body, which have to be digested. So often when I see somebody that comes in as an acupuncture patient, and I check all of their meridians, and I mean, they have, usually they have symptoms from A to Z, right. and, and, and yet they look like the most perfect person in the world, health-wise. So it's this, I, it's this, it's, yeah, it's this uh, dichotomy. I'll start going to these extra ordinary meridians and start, start touching on them and seeing what the impedance or resistance is there. And oftentimes it'll tell me because there are organs that are storage houses for certain emotions. The lungs are for grief. You know, um, you know, the liver is for anger. I mean, there are so many places. If you ask the body what's really going on, you got to be ready for the answer because it's going to tell you. <laughs> if you know what you're doing when you're asking, it's going to give you an answer that's like a child that's going to tell the exact truth and get you in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so what I find is, you know, when we're starting to work through those transgenerational traumas, that is just like, and what a gift, because you never, you know, when you're with your dad and you try to say the right thing, but his energy's stuck, you know, you're like, you try to put him in the right position Every and line him up I for success and you try to line him up for success to take that next step, but yet he's not. Well, that's because my dear, he's passed it to you to do. And, and it's true. And they even knew this back in, in ancient history that whatever, whatever that energy was, that, that, that messenger RNA or whatever that hasn't been, been transmuted and was chosen not to be transmuted has been passed for you to do the work. And now that you're more prepared, more vital, have more reserves, then just imagine it as if your dad's coming to visit inside of you. I know that sounds very strange. No, no, it's, it does, no, no, it's good. <laughs> just, just imagine, just imagine as if that energy that's coming and bubbling up is something that is very familiar, like, like from him, but yet also part of you. And what he didn't do is face it, forgive it, give it compassion, mm -hmm. give it the, give it, give it gratitude for, for being that energy that got him out of trouble or that, be, or that got him through the depression, or that helped him to survive in the com concentration camp. Don't push it away anymore, and don't condemn it. Give it complete, your com unabashed, you know, surrendership to listening, to being, to being um, helpful, and, and to being um, in a place of reverence for it, and, and let it come up. Let yourself feel it fully, absolutely. Don't don't hide it at all. As a matter of fact, there's a book by Rumi, oh, excuse me, a poem by Rumi called The Guest House. If you've never read the poem The Guest House, it will give you insightful measure of how to actually deal with this transgenerational trauma. And, and trauma is not there to come out of the closet and scare you. It is meant to come out of the closet into the light so you can see what it is, which was just a choice that was not made at a higher vibration, so ended up being a choice that had a residue. It ended up having a repercussion. And so all you're dealing with is the shadow of a repercussion. And that repercussion just needs to vibrate out, be surrounded with love, and be given to whatever you call your unified consciousness, nature, connectedness, your higher self, your divine God, your whatever it is to you, so that then you can transfer it to your higher mind. The problem is a lot of people keep it in their rational, logical mind where it, rever where it reverberates more, causes more percussion, and starts to get into that prison of the mind effect, which the rational, logical mind is wonderful at doing, starting to spiral down into overthinking it. So it really needs to go from a place from the gut to the heart, and then directly to the higher mind. And throughout all of you know, the generation of humanity, that's how we have gotten through any trauma, is the transfer of it per transpersonally so that we don't have to hold it ourselves. And it's not that we're, it, it's not that we're excusing it and, and disowning it, it's that we can all own it together. It's all we can own it together. And when we own it together, then it's like it disperses in the wind.
just like ashes from somebody who's been cremated. And we honor those, don't we? I mean, they're dusty and they're, they're, they're kind of scary, like, like, a, like a clown. I mean, like, look, have you ever seen an urn of ashes? I mean, right. you see it and sometimes you're like, oh, oh, that's a person. Right. You know, well, you know, that is kind of the idea is to get over this idea that it's something scary and realize that it's just dust and ashes to be dispersed. But first you have to honor it. First, you have to allow it to come up and listen to it, you know, and have it, let it have its space. And what I notice is you can actually do, if you, if you want to have some help with this, there are classical Chinese medicine uh, physicians, uh, acupuncturists that do deep work in the uh, divergent and extraordinary meridians. And this is called alchemical acupuncture. So, I mean, it, believe it or not, this is um, something that I feel is very much in alignment with where we're headed with health in today's age because the this was knowledge that was suppressed for a very long time when communist china came they actually suppressed any teachings of the deeper mystical realm of acupuncture the deeper realms of this type of energy that can be um, um trauma that that needs to know how to get out of itself out of our way in its own way and so if you want, you know, look for a uh, acupuncturist in your area that does alchemical acupuncture on extraordinary meridians or divergent meridians. And you'll find that these, um, these deeper traumas can, can have some, some help from, from a professional as well as what you're doing in your life already. Dr. Amy Coleman, you are truly amazing. Like I literally do not say that very often. And <laughs> I mean, you've kind of blown my mind. You've set me on kind of like a trip. Um, listening to you. I mean, honestly, I've been so silent listening to you, but it's really resonant. Like you have a very resonant frequency. I know you know that, but um, alchemical acupuncture. I wanted to ask you about acupuncture to end the show, but I know you got to get going. This has been so amazing. I want to have you back um, sure. to talk much more about acupuncture. Are you cool to do that? Sure. I'd be glad to. And, and I have to say, Jay, you know, of course, anything that you're seeing, and that you're resonating with it. All I have to say is it takes one to know one because you wouldn't, <laughs> you wouldn't see it and understand it unless you have that yourself. No, I really truly appreciate that. And um, that's an honor and I'm humbled and privileged and you know, I accept that graciously. So thank you so much. If someone wants to work with you, uh, I, I do have to ask you this question. So this, what you just do, is this literally what you give your patients, this kind of communication or is it more of the, you know, holistic, you actually work on that acupuncture. I mean, do they get this level of conversation with you? Because if they do. <laughs> they do. Wow. I mean, you're amazing. I mean, honestly, so how can somebody work with you um, if they want to reach out to you and connect with you? What's the easiest way for them to do that? Yeah, sure. So I have a functional integrative medicine clinic in Lexington, Kentucky. It's called WellSmart Medical Services, but I also do virtual work. I'm licensed in five states, which are uh, California, Virginia, Florida, Kentucky, and then I'm pending, I believe actually two more, which is uh, Texas and North Carolina. So I like to make myself available um, virtually and physically. Uh, so if you want more information, you can go to wellsmartservice.com. That's www.wellsmartservice.com. And uh, I'm on Instagram as well, at wellsmartservice, and on I guess, Twitter at, at inside at well inside in out <laughs> and spelled not I N but with just an N and uh, just uh, published a book. Oh, just published a book three years ago. <laughs> right. Right. How time flies called yeah. discovering your own doctor within. Yeah. And I, honestly, like I said, I'm going to buy that book on Amazon um, instantly as soon as I get off of you and send it to my wife, Monica too. But um, again, amazing like i you you really really touched me i i truly appreciate it i i did not expect like it was going to go to this level but just uh you are a master i mean i i again i don't say that very often to the people i talk to and i talk to a lot of amazing people um but it's, it's a tribute and a credit to you and uh let me just say for everybody who's watching the show obviously please support the amazing people that come on i mean dr amy coleman is easily in the top three or four people that I've ever spoken to. And I've spoken to a lot of amazing people. So please go to her website. Um, what was it again? WellSmart? WellSmart Service. That's W-E-L-L-S-M-A-R-T-S-E-R-V-I-C-E.com. Yep. And uh, if you are a person in California, especially she's licensed to work with you and you are needing of this kind of unbelievable integrative care and concern and compassion and kindness, 
um, this is the person to work with. So as always, guys, remember, raise your vibration to optimize your love creation. We will see you guys very soon.